So how strong could a 3D printed hammer actually be? In this video, we go through a number of different design iterations and we end up testing these all the way to the end in order to see how much abuse they can actually take as compared to a regular hammer. So very often when designing a product for 3D printing, people have fears about the overall structural integrity of the part because of the layer lines within it. And while this is a common concern, it's really not terribly relevant because very often if you just design for the material that you're actually using, i.e. a 3D printed insert thermoplastic, you can design around the constraints of that material within its uh, native strength zones and create something that is actually very viable. So in this video, we actually created a number of hammers. And when we started with the hammer project, the first thing we started with were basic mallets because mallets are something that you can place a lot of material into. So we thought, okay, we wanna make sure that this hammer is fully reliable and comparable to a regular hammer. In order to do that, we're gonna be able to need to shove a lot of material into it. So initially we started with a mallet. We made sure that the outer walls were quite thick and we started with a standard handle. And that mallet actually ended up performing quite well. We ended up starting off with soda cans that were to be crushed because we thought, ah, these will be easy. And it turned out that actually they're kind of tough to crush a soda can. And it ended up being more an experiment of how those work than anything else. Because we used the 3D printed mallet and we thought, oh, it's too light or it's not strong enough to really crush this can. Because since these mallets were fully plastic, they were much lighter than a typical type of hammer, almost like a rubber mallet. But then we went and got a dead blow hammer, which is full of lead shot, and it also kind of had trouble crushing the soda can. So these things were just way stronger than we had expected. So what we ended up doing was taking that test and basically making it a tie because both hammers performed about the same. The lighter mallet that was 3D printed did not have any damage to the handle, did not have any real damage to the head of it at all. And the dead blow hammer, which had lead shot, was also pretty much performing the same. But since it had more effort to get going, it had about as much force as the lighter hammer, which had less effort to get it going. So it was more of an ergonomic issue than it was really a material restriction. So we went on to the next biggest thing that we could whack, which was a cinder block. And while the plastic hammer did take abuse from whacking the cinder block, it was able to ultimately crush the cinder block. And many of the areas that people would generally attribute to the failure point, which would be like the handle itself, were fine. The overall structural integrity of the part was fine, but since it was plastic, it takes a lot of abuse and it was not the type of plastic that was intended to take a large amounts of impact at its point of impact. It was PLA, which has a very high rigidity, um, but is also quite brittle. So a hammerhead is really not the best option for it. If we ever wanted to reprint this hammer, we might use something like ABS or nylon, and it would hold up about as well as a dead blow hammer. And you also have to remember that while we were using a solid plastic mallet for the 3D printed version, it would be very easy to design in a hollowed cavity and insert some kind of weight into these parts as well. 3D printing allows you to pause a print, insert material, and then continue on with the print so that you can create the same kind of overmolded situation as the dead blow hammer that has a bunch of lead shot inside of it. So it's very easy to insert extra materials into a 3D printed part in order to improve its properties and its performance as a finished product. But then we went on and did many other tests. Uh, throughout the process of this video, we actually iterated on the design of the mallet a couple of times. We wanted to make the handle, so we added an extension to the handle, which ended up creating a leverage point to where the hammer would perform fine, but the handle extension itself would break off. So if we were to do that again, we would probably change the material being used and figure out some way of reinforcing it by like wrapping it in some kind of fabric so that it cannot shatter. We also hadn't glued it together, so that extra level of adhesion would have helped with that issue. Um, the other issue was that with that hammer, we had actually added on flanges because we thought that the ha handle might actually be the place to where it would break. And since it's a 3D printed part, we don't really have any geometry constraints of like other typical processes. So adding on flanges, but having a lower material density, as in like an infill of like 25%, has the same strength at the neck of the hammer, but allows us to still uh, have a lightweight system if we want a lightweight system. But ultimately the flange just wasn't necessary because it offered no benefits over what the typical hammer did when we fully printed it. Uh, we never had failures of the handles itself at the head of the hammer, which is something that we kind of anticipated. 
but that's because we rounded out the stress concentration so there was no single sharp corner there. Just a large fillet or a chamfer itself could be something to create an extra piece of structure at those type of bending points if you were creating something other than a hammer. Now, we did take that mallet and we were like, okay, well, it's a hammer, it should be able to put in nails. And the mallet itself actually was able to put in nails. But because it's solid plastic, it's not something that you wanna put in nails with because the nails create this very concentrated point of force to where you will degrade the head of a hammer over time. Though again, the mallet held up really well for a PLA part. We expected it to have a nail go shoving right through it. But since PLA is such a hard plastic, it actually holds up quite well than softer plastics like an ABS or something would. Because since it's so hard, it's actually able to resist the nail uh, quite well. But we wanted to make a hammer that was actually for hammering, a very real hammer. These were all fine demos, but a mallet is not very common, not very practical, and is it not really viable for like mass production with printing. So if you were to make a hammer that was to be mass produced, how would you actually do it? Well, we wanna make sure that it doesn't really mess with people at all. So we want it to be a good size and good proportions. So we went with a standard kind of hammer shape, standard hammer proportions. And then we went ahead and made the handle just slightly oval. That oval shape makes the handle a lot more reliable and durable over time. It also helps it to fit into your hand just a little bit better than a fully circular handle does. But the other thing we wanted to do is make sure that the hammer wouldn't really necessarily wear out. And in order to do that, you actually have to use metal because that is why hammers are made from metal is because it's very durable and will last forever. So if we wanted this hammer to have a good long lifespan, we had to have a metal component in it because plastic will never be able to hold up to that. But if you're designing for a hybrid system, what you can do is design a 3D printed part to accept a metal insert. In this case, we used some bolts that were lying around, which ended up giving us a smaller tip that we actually wanted, but that's okay for this demo. We could always make the bolts bigger if we wanted to, to make a very rod head hammer. This ended up kind of being more of a finishing type of hammer. So we have that bolt embedded into the tip of the hammer. Now you have something that is durable enough through the hammer and the head and everything else to last for quite a while. But then we took this hammer and we put some nails in. We started with a very basic finishing nail and it went in just fine. Again, the hammer is a little bit light, so we might add a little bit more heft to it if we were redoing it, but it wasn't that big of a deal. But if you were a carpenter, it'd certainly be irritating if you were putting in nails all day long. But as like a hobby hammer, it's fine, but long-term it would need to have a lot more heft in it. And then we went in and put in a standard penny nail that you would find around. And it was able to put that nail in as well. Compared to the regular hammer, it performed fine. And again, it was a little bit lighter, but not that big of a deal. There was no structural damage to it at all, and we ended up putting in uh, several more nails, nails all day long. Uh, this hammer would not break down. There was degradation around the tip because again, we had created the tip to encase that bolt. If we were to redo it, we would have the bolt be a little bit longer and have it be the full front head of the hammer. So it's not an issue. But again, this was just a demo to show how could you design a part that could be produced. This hammer right here could be a finished product right here. This could be a finishing hobby hammer or a little sand hammer or a little rock hammer or something else. There are ways to turn this into a real product. And the fundamental principles of how to print it in this orientation so that the handle is strong, giving it an oval handle and giving it a tip that is reinforced with some other material because it's very easy to add inserts to something like this. All of those can be applied to all types of different parts and pieces out there. So hopefully this video was a little bit useful to you and showing you how 3D printed parts can actually be engineered to do pretty much whatever you want. You just have to be aware of what you're working with so that you can design for it, and, but then still be able to create an equivalent product so long as you know how you're using your process and how you're using your materials. This way you get all the advantages that 3D printing can offer as far as like no molding cost and lower minimum volumes so that the business model can be a little bit better, but you have to make sure that the engineering follows along and is able to create a commensurate and comparable product that doesn't disappoint a customer in any sort of way. So that was the point of these demos, just to show the rigidity and the durability of what a 3D printed part can do and show a design philosophy of how you can create good equivalent products for whatever your product may be by using these same type of principles. Have a great day, everybody.